All right, guys, welcome back to another edition of Mail Call. If you want to see more of this 870 in action, check out our video in the description box below. Until that point, I'm just going to destroy the rest of this wall. Well, yeah, that, uh, that shotgun tearing apart that wall was pretty awesome, wasn't it? It worked pretty well. Yeah, outstanding. Uh, we have more of that on the way. That was actually part of a series that we did uh, called Remington 870 versus Stuff. Uh, if you guys have some suggestions for, you know, taking a gun design and just shooting a whole bunch of random stuff with it, let me know what you'd like to see, mm -hmm. and we will most certainly accommodate that request to make sure we're going to do it. Well, uh, not, we've not only guns, but also stuff. I mean, like, kind of like the Will Shoot Your Stuff episodes, but, you know, just random items that you want to see blown up. You're like, hey, what does this, this look like if you get it, if it's shot with a, a Mosin, or what does it look like if it's shot with a Berniki Slug or something yeah, like that? So. exactly. So uh, submit those ideas, and we'll be happy to accommodate them. Uh, anyway, let's get along with uh, today's mail call episode. This is going to be episode number five, and uh, we're going to talk about just kind of just some random questions. Um, I would say mostly gunsmithing stuff, but we'll try to include a transcript below. Uh, that way you guys can see the actual questions that are written out the way we see them. So uh, let's get along to uh, some of the questions here. Shoot. All right. Let's see. The Covert Engager 00. He didn't leave a name. He just left his <laughs> YouTube handle. But Covert Engager 00 wants to know, I was hoping you could do a video explaining clearly and concisely how Magnum stands for a type of ammunition and not the name of every larger than normal looking revolver. I'm aware some models that use this ammunition have the word Magnum in their name, but I've had problems explaining this to most people since they get their gun knowledge from Call of Duty. <laughs> That's about right. Well, uh, to answer your question, uh, Magnum, what Magnum is generally going to refer to is a pressure and velocity range. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's take um, Elmer Keith. All right, Elmer Keith took 44 special revolvers and loaded them really, really hot, and it got to a point where he was cracking frames and blowing guns up, and eventually they needed to build a sturdier and heavier duty gun in order to handle uh, what would become the 44 Magnum cartridge, a higher pressure, higher velocity version of its original parent cartridge. So that's really where you get Magnum from. Magnum generally means something that is more powerful than its original parent cartridge might have been uh, originally developed for. Mm -hmm. All right, that's Basically. a pretty good way of explaining it. Pretty much. So, I mean, and the same goes for rifle cartridges as well. I mean, right. you have like, okay, 308. All right, and then you have 30 out 6, which is a higher pressure, higher velocity cartridge than 308. But then you have like a 300 Win Mag, which is 300 Winchester Magnum. And uh, those cases are actually specifically designed for those type of calibers. I mean, they're a thicker walled case, and they're also belted at the bottom. At mm -hmm. the case head, you'll notice a uh, thick rim, like kind of an extra rim right at the bottom of the case head and that's actually to help headspace the round in those chambers and also to mitigate some of that pressure on the brass and keep the brass around a little bit longer especially if you're a hand loader um, but I mean they're they're butt stomping rounds they really are they certainly are so, and you know so magnum is going to be something that might have started life as a, a less more lesser powerful cartridge but then became something more powerful mm -hmm. just like 38 special yep. so the way that you take 38 special is you look at like 38 Smith & Wesson, which originally was like a black powder cartridge. You look at 30, uh, 3220, mm -hmm. which is an original military cartridge uh, way back in the day. You had a 32 caliber projectile on 20 grains of black powder. Then you had 38 Smith & Wesson, which was like a 38 projectile like you'd see today, but on a black powder charge. Mm -hmm. Then you had 38 Special, mm -hmm. which 38 Special was a smokeless version, slightly refined of the same overall concept, you know, getting that little pill out at X amount of velocity, at X amount of pressures in order to make that gun design handle that load. Mm -hmm. Then you have a 357 Magnum, which, okay, we take that same thing, we're going to push that same projectile faster and faster and get the, the hottest load that we can out of that to get the maximum amount of velocity that we can. Mm -hmm. So that's where Magnum cartridges come from, and hopefully that answers your question pretty well. Mm -hmm. And something else, too, uh, just real quick, is sure. the... Uh, the Magnum calibers, as far as like revolver calibers go, like 38 Special and then 357 Mag, mm -hmm. the calibers are interchangeable only in the Magnum guns. So right. in a 44 Mag, you can also shoot 44 Special, and uh, it, not only is it safe to shoot it, 
but it's practical too. I mean, it's for ammo costs and especially like hand loading, uh, you're not going to wear your brass out as easily with special loads mm -hmm. than magnum loads. And also, if you try to shoot 44 mag or 38 or uh, 357 mag out of a 38 special gun or 44 special gun, the ammunition's not even going to fit in the cylinder. Right. Okay. I mean, it's going to lock the cylinder up when you try to close it and it's just not going to work regardless. That's why they've got, you know, 44 Special is a little bit shorter cartridge, and a 44 Magnum is a little bit longer to accommodate the extra powder and the heavier weight projectiles as well. That makes perfect so. sense. And a nice thing, too, just to add one more thing before we move on, is the fact that if you have, say, a 44 Magnum, and then say you load like a light 44 Special, mm -hmm. that's something that a, a smaller framed a child or a lady or oh, yeah. a guy or whoever, someone with weak hand strength, could maybe shoot that gun and enjoy it without having the full power Magnum loads uh, you know, that are, of course, are afforded by the, the heavier parent caliber. Well, really, anybody. Anybody, so. exactly. So uh, we appreciate that question. Thank you. All right, now Mitchell wants to know, any chance you could tell me what scope is on the AR platform rifle at the top of your YouTube page? The one being fired by the red-headed woman. Well, that red-headed woman's my wife, and the, uh, the rifle that she's sitting behind is an LWRC Reaper. All right, that's a Reaper uh, topped off with a Schmidt & Bender scope and it's got a uh, Barrett Boars uh, device on it. Now that Smith & Bender was like a, I don't remember if it's a 30 millimeter or a 34 millimeter, it's like a five to 25 by 56. I mean, it's a really, really nice. It's a huge scope on yeah, that it's rifle. It's a huge uh, scope, and it's got the bore system on there, which is the Barrett optical ranging system. So basically the thing will tell you how far you are away from your target and basically, you know, in a sense where to hold over or at least what mill to use. Yeah. I mean, it's it's pretty neat setup, but. Oh yeah. Yeah, that rig there, that, that LWRC rifle with that optic and the bore system is probably uh, the better part of a $12,000 rig mm -hmm. when it's all said and done. But uh, the rifle that that fellow belongs to is a really good friend of mine, very, very intelligent individual, um, very successful individual. He's got a lot of awesome guns. Some of the really interesting guns that uh, you've seen on our channel that are either really rare and obscure and hard to get or very, very prohibitively expensive, sometimes we borrow them from him. Mm -hmm. Uh, really good guy. Anyway, uh, thanks for that question. We actually do get that question a bit. Mm -hmm. So thanks, Mitchell. All right, so Scorimp 100. Sorimp. Sorimp. S-O-R-I-N-P 100, whatever that is, wants to know, I have a Turkish Mauser 1918 Ankara without a bolt. Does the bolt from a K98 or a Yugo fit it? Well, to answer your question, the Yugo uses an intermediate length action that is not compatible with the K98 series of rifles. So a Yugo bolt will not fit in a standard Car 98 uh, type action. Now to answer your question, most of those Turkish Mausers were either produced on German machinery to German specs, or in some cases were actually produced German rifles that were sent as war aid to the Turks. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, a standard K98 bolt or a, a G98 Standard 98 bolt, whether it's a bent or straight, as long as it head spaces properly, will drop into that action and should function just fine. Uh, so to answer your question, there you have that. And uh, that should be pretty cut and dry there. That's a gunsmithing question, which by the way, we do have more how-to videos on the way. Uh, stay tuned for those. We have a ton of concepts in the pipeline for that. Uh, so thanks for that question. Whoa, how do you say that name? Sir Della Titi. Sir Della Titi wants to know. I just learned that the shot show itself was forbidding people to carry a loaded weapon for security. Now, to me, this seems obvious because I am from Canada, where concealed carry is absolutely forbidden for civilians anywhere, anytime. What do you think of the shot show not allowing you the freedom to carry, and how is it different from, say, carrying in a normal public place like a big box store or a coffee place or whatever? That's an excellent question. It is. I mean, the SHOT Show is the largest firearms trade show, basically, in the world, I'm sure. I mean, oh, especially yeah. in America. But, um, you know, there are a lot of guns there on display. There's a lot of ammunition on display. And obviously, they don't want some crazy running in there and just grabbing a Barrett 50 off the wall and grabbing some 50 cal ammo from one of the manufacturers and, da -da -da -da, you know, Right, right. Shots, well, but and there's machine guns in there. No, there's machine guns in there. So yeah, they don't want somebody. Military stuff. They don't want somebody sneaking in a hundred round belt and hopping behind a machine gun and doing something stupid. But now, here's a few things about Shot Show that people don't know. All of the guns on the floor have the firing pins removed, mm -hmm. or in some way are made to be inoperable. Yeah, they're deactivated. So they way. are somewhat deactivated. All the guns you see at Shot Show won't fire a single shot, even if you chambered around. Mm -hmm. All right, so and that's one thing. Also, the ammunition is deactivated. Basically, they bring in dummy rounds 
they are basically just a brass case, no primer, no powder, and a projectile. So it's basically the same kind of dummy round that you would load if you were hand loading, just to check your headspace or whatever the case may be, just to have an overall length gauge for your rifle. Right. So. I have always thought that it's a little silly. It seems that when you have the world's largest gun-related trade show and all of those gun owners under one roof, it would be kind of a nice uh, show of force to say, all right, well, everyone here could be packing. Mm -hmm. But for whatever reasons, whether <clears throat> political or security measures, they've deemed that they don't want people carrying firearms in the SHOT Show. Now, I can say I've been to SHOT Show twice. Mm -hmm. All right, I went in 2013 and I went in 2014. They don't really search you. Uh, the main thing that they're concerned with is they want to make sure you have your credentials, mm -hmm. uh, that you're supposed to be there, <laughs> and that whatever, you know, oh, yeah, we've... we've yeah, that reminds me. There yeah, was we a, ran into some crap over the credentials. <laughs> Speaking but. of the credentials, there was a... Um, we were just walking in the show one day, and there was this guy there, and, I mean, there was security all around him. I mean, he had a whole gang of they security They were on guards. him, like, white on rice. Oh, yeah, they were like, you know, flies on a pancake, whatever. But anyways, I mean, they were all over this guy, and I mean, they were like, boom, like that. They were there. I mean, those oh, guys yeah. are everywhere. This yellow shirt. Yeah, the oh, yeah. security yellow guys. Now, one thing I can say is that there was never a point at SHOT Show where I didn't feel safe and secure. Oh, no, not at all. There, there are plenty of armed police officers walking around, patrolling the area. So to answer your question, I think that people should uh, be able to carry in events like that, although for some small measure, I can sort of understand where they're coming from because there are a lot of firearms there. They want to make sure that everyone is safe and they want to be under un basically controlling uh, everyone's safety and security. I guess to a small degree, I can sort of understand. However, I I'm a little torn. Well, I, and know. too, you got to think of the uh, NSSF. I mean, I'm sure that they have a huge liability or they could have a huge liability right. if people were allowed to carry there. And especially, I mean, it it's a convention center that the NSSF rents. I mean, it's a SANS convention center. It so could they may, be a SANS policy. They may have their own policy right. regarding that. But Well, uh, we appreciate that question. Um, but it's certainly pertinent. All right. So, all right. CXVX Day okay. wants to know, can steel 7.62 by 54 rim cases be reloaded? The short answer is yes, they can. The long answer would no. be no, you probably don't want to bother with it. Uh, for one, it's a Burdan primed, uh, you know, cartridge, which means that instead of one centrally uh, located flash hole that can just be punched out with a standard decapping pin, it has two uh, opposed flash holes off center mm -hmm. that require special tools to deprime. Basically, That's the yeah, first big yeah, issue. Basically, something you have to pry the primer off. Right, or you less. have to hydraulically remove the primer, fill the case full of water, smash a rod down on there, and it punches the primer out. Okay, so one, it's Burdan primed. Two, it's steel. Okay. So it's only going to be used for so many firings before it wears out or it's going to get too brittle and it's going to split well, eventually. Not only that, I mean, the steel is not as malleable as brass is, not as long, um, not as uh, long life as brass would be. And also, you know, you got to think your reloading dies are steel, your case is steel. So those two don't really intermingle very well and it's going to wear your dies out very quickly. Yep. Even if you try to reload uh, boxer primed steel cases like some of the Wolf, like 308 that comes in. Uh, 45 Wolf is bought yeah, the yeah, yeah, 45 Wolf. I mean, it'll just wear your dies out prematurely. Well, so. three Burdan primers are extremely difficult to get. They are. And they come in three sizes. <laughs> so that makes it even more difficult. You have to know exactly what size you're going to put back in it. The short answer is don't bother. Now, that was a very pertinent question about reloading 7.62 by 54 rim from C the Day. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, next question we have from Old Gray Wolf 58. He wants to know, what are your thoughts on the Beretta Nano pistol? Well, haven't had a chance to shoot it, but I mean, we've handled it plenty in the store. We've got one on the counter right here. Yeah. So, I mean, it seems like a solid gun for what it is. I mean, very compact, slim profile, single stack nine millimeter. I mean, there's a sure. lot of those on the market, but um, Beretta Nano is, it's pretty tiny. Yeah, it is a small gun. Uh, as you know, Beretta also this year they released a gun called the Pico, oh, yeah. uh, which is a 380 version of the Beretta Nano. And both the guns are extremely small, very mm -hmm. concealable. Um, I like the sights on the Nano. Mm -hmm. The trigger is a little bit on the heavy side. It's got a long and stagey double action. However, it's very safe. So if you're going to treat it like a double action revolver and just load it and then put it in your pocket or holster and run with it, mm -hmm. um, it's a great gun to just pull out and there it is. You get used to that trigger and where it breaks. I'm sure you can do a lot of good shooting with it. Um, I have shot the Nano myself and it is a very accurate little pistol for what it is. It's got a short, stiff barrel. 
um, relatively decent accuracy. Um, it doesn't have a manual slide stop on it that allows you to drop the slide on an empty chamber or whatever you want to do. You have to drop the mag and then disengage the lock in order to close it. That to me is a minor detriment. However, I do understand why they did it and that was because they could keep the gun nice and slim without anything hanging off the side of it. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, eventually we'll get to do a video on the Beretta Nano for you. So uh, Old Gray Wolf, we appreciate that question. That's very pertinent. Thank you. Robert wants to know, have you heard of the G2 Research Rip Ammo? I'd like to see a review on this and what do you guys think of it? Yeah, we've seen it. You want to tell them? I mean, uh, it's, it's kind of weird. I mean, it, it goes back to the whole um, segmenting projectile versus solid hollow point, you know, dumping all the energy into a target at one time. I mean, that, we actually answered a question similar to this last episode, I think, about hollow point ammunition. Yeah. And uh, basically, the ammo, the rip ammo, it comes in, it's got a central core, kind of lightweight, and then the pedals break off and they go their separate way. They basically just flower out in this fashion. You know, the core comes in, core keeps penetrating, the pedals flower out like this, and they have about four to five inches of penetration, which... With the I mean, huge temporary cavity. With a, it's, it's a pretty big temporary cavity for what it is. I mean, you get the big temporary cavity, the pedals come out, and then the other uh, core continues to pass through, and it passes through uh, 16 inches of ballistic gel. I mean, we've seen it tested. But as far as something that I would put in my gun, I can't really say that I would carry it on a daily basis. I think it's a little gimmicky so. myself. I mean, if you're going to carry, let's just say, a 9 millimeter for defense, um, I think the uh, the spear gold dot and a 147 grain, it's hard to beat. that's an old standby, and it's hard to beat. I mean, like my FNX that I'm carrying right now, I'm running 200 grain. Uh, this is the, uh, Hornady, the Hornady, like Hornady FTX. Yeah. I'm running 200 grain Hornady FTX in my uh, carry gun right now. Mm -hmm. But in my 9 millimeters, I run the Spear Gold Dot and 147. Well, I'll tell you what, you can't beat the Gold Dot because, I mean, they pretty much set the industry standard as far as jacket and core, um, basically... Adhesion. Uh, yeah, adhesion. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, those things, they retain so much weight, it's not even funny. I mean, we've got a couple of demo uh, hollow points over there that have been expanded in water. And literally, I mean, the whole thing is there. I yep. mean, it just does not lose Excellent anything. weight retention. Uh, weight retention mm -hmm. is excellent. Uh, bonded core oh, yeah. to the uh, jacket, which is excellent for weight retention. Pre-segmented jacket, which makes expansion really nice. Oh, yeah. Uh, the cavities on them are very generous. They don't fill up full of gene material or other things that can keep them from expanding. Excellent bullet, guys. All right, so to answer your question, Robert, uh, I think it's a little bit of a gimmick, but time will tell. All right? Maybe a collector's item one day. We never can tell. Maybe. So. Uh, but thanks for that question, Robert. It's very pertinent. Mr. Saturn 1964 wants to know, will any AR upper from any company fit on any AR lower? That's an excellent question. I mean, pretty much. I mean, as long as it has a standard lower with two pins, I mean, for the most part, they're going to drop right on. I mean, you can drop on a uh, forged, um, forged upper onto a... Um, polymer lower. Polymer lower. You can drop it onto a milled lower. Whatever the case may be. You it, could it have a not, polymer upper that'll drop on a yeah. billet lower. But the only thing is, I mean, they may not match up like concentrically on the sides. I mean, because the material may be thicker or, or thinner, you know, depending on what it was made from. But for the most part, as long as it's a two pin setup and it's a standard setup, then it's going to drop right on. There are very, very few uh, exceptions to the rule. I mean, generally, most ARs are going to be produced uh, to one general accepted standard for mm -hmm. the most part. Um, now, you know, what makes a, a, an AR say mil spec versus not mil spec? I mean, that, that word gets thrown around a lot. All mil spec means is something that's produced to a military standard. That's all it means. Which is usually a pretty high standard. I mean, it's usually a pretty high standard, both in fit and finish, mm -hmm. uh, tolerances, clearance, and the, the type of finish that's used, a certain quality of anodizing on the aluminum, a certain quality of parkerization on metal surfaces, uh, so forth, and, and things like that. So to answer your question, generally, yes. Most AR lowers and uppers will generally come right together. Some of them, the pins can be a little bit tight, but those wear in with time as mm -hmm. the gun uh, breaks in and gets shot a little bit more. Oh, yeah. uh, those pins get a little bit easier uh, to move as yeah, time goes it, it on. It loosens up a little bit over time, and it makes it easier just to push them out by hand. Initially, you might need a tool to actually get the pin started and pull them out, but you know, shoot about 500 rounds or so, it'll wear in just fine. Sure. So. And uh, actually, for those of you that don't know, um, in the military manual for the AR, the tool that you use for getting the pins to pop out, like say you're having a hard time moving your axis pins, mm -hmm. uh, your action pins on an AR, use a, a bullet. Mm -hmm. 
That's take it. a take a five five six round, push it, and that's your tool for yep. taking the gun apart. Uh, most military guns are generally going to be put together with that in mind. So uh, we appreciate that question. Guys, we've been getting a ton of questions from you uh, about all kind of various subjects. We'll try our best moving forward to make sure that we're compiling the questions into somewhat of a, a general marching order so that the title of the video can kind of reflect what those questions are gonna be about. Sometimes they'll be random questions. Other times they'll be a little bit more specific. Uh, we appreciate your time today. Thank you for watching. And uh, most importantly, we appreciate your business. Uh, we've got a lot of customers that have come by uh, that are YouTubers that have come by and spent money and have showed their support uh, here at the shop here at Moss so we greatly appreciate the support that all you guys have given and uh, be sure to stay tuned for the videos because we have many more coming and uh, we'll certainly catch you next time take it easy